here. I think it's so fabulous. It's all for sale, and uh, there's a price list up here if anyone wants to uh, take home a genuine treasure. Don't anyone call the fire marshal. It's a safe call. You're safe. And if the siren goes by, it's not for us. The first reader tonight, these readings take place, let me say, on the third Sunday of every month, and we have great people reading in, in uh, November. We have John Mincheski and Emily Carter. In December, we have Dorothy Benham, Marco Hasse, Margaret Hasse, and uh, Robert Samarato, who played with the uh, St. Paul Chamber Orchestra for years and is now and has always been writing poetry all along. Uh, perhaps we will have our reservation deal refined by then, but perhaps not. <laughs> At any rate, you're in for a great reading, and I thank you all so much for being here. And I should say also that this is being videotaped and will be played on the Internet under, I think, is it the, under the Mildred Pierce my, uh, website or whatever it is. I'm totally illiterate on that sort of thing. And Mr. Byers is also recording it, so you can speak to him if you want to record it. At any rate, allow me to introduce my beloved friend and great poet, Phoebe Hansen, who was a little behind on her publishing, which we are all ragging on her about. <laughs> Somebody said... 300 books. Yes, they're just in your drawer. Someone said we're going to have to... All writers are going to have to start a Phoebe Anon group because we are. her work is beautiful, fabulous, wonderful, and she has not had a book since 1985. Uh, but it's a great book. She's yeah. like J.D. Salinger. Yes, exactly. Like J.D. Salinger, yeah. that guy from St. John's. What was his name? Yeah. Another name. Yeah. 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 Powers, yes. Yeah. Phoebe, her favorite, her fabulous book, which you haven't read it, you love it. And if you haven't read it, there are still a few floating around the Sacred Hearts. And her, she, she's been included in tons of anthologies. And one of the notable ones is an anthology called From Mother to Daughter, which is covered by Pocket Books. She currently is working on a grant from the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, and she will be going to Italy to work on that book. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it all so you know I don't have the big head. I'm reading other people's poems too. I read other poets. This first poem I'm going to read in honor of Bill, whom I've known for 25 years. We were on Poetry Out Loud together. That's where I met him. And I'm reading it in honor of him because it's the only poem I've ever written that has a reference to one of the islands in his book, Madagascar, which was dear to my heart as a Lutheran Free Church girl. Those of you who don't know what the Lutheran Free Church, did, free church is, forget it. And it was not free. <laughs> Sturdy Arms, it's called. Oh, by the way, I have to promote this little book called Minnesota Poetry Calendar, 2001. It's a wonderful book. And what it says after my name is, I've been writing since I was 10, that's true. Although she's done hundreds of readings, she has rarely submitted poems for publication. That's true, too, as you heard. A friend's remark, and there's the friend, Jill Breckenridge, <coughs> galvanized her into action a year ago. Well, Jill said, I resigned myself to reading your published work posthumously. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. So I started sending out. I started submitting. Well, we'll let this scene play itself out, right? <laughs> These are the Icelandic people. These are the Icelandic people, the colony of Norway. Welcome to the Icelanders, which I think of as a colony of Norway. Oh, it seems like that. No. I'm not, that's all right, I said, I'm letting, I'm letting this real scene play itself out. Hi, Marcy. I have yet to read my first poem, so it's okay. And it's an honor of you. Are you going? Are you leaving? <laughs> Bill, block the door! Block the door, Bill! No one gets to leave. At least until I'm done. All right. Are you ready now? Oh, God. Now the fire marshal will really be happy. All right, here's the poem that I'm going to It was in Poetry Hello. Calendar 2001. And I'm dedicating it to Bill because it has a mention of Madagascar. You've got sturdy arms, my blind date said, a student from Norway studying to be a missionary to Madagascar. I was pretending to study English lit, but really on alert all times for a suitable husband. You would make a good worker out in the mission field, my date went on. I stood on the steps of Sievertson Hall, Oxford College, a few blocks from where the Mississippi River flowed past to the University of Minnesota. That's where I should have gone, I thought, where I'd meet atheists and agnostics <laughs> studying to get rich someday. And when I married one, I need higher cleaning women so I could sit for hours in my room, my sturdy arm, writing poem after poem after poem. <laughs> read this poem unless Natalie Goldberg showed up, and here she is, and it's dedicated to her to dedicate the poems tonight, at least two, because her name is in it, and she'll remember the situation. It's called, How Old Are You? Ruby, my ninth grade reading student, leans toward me across the table, asks me, how old are you? Groans when I tell her. Oh, no, you must feel bad being so old. <laughs> then she leans even closer to ask that question students often ask, the one I have never learned not to answer. Do you mind if I get personal, Mrs. Hansen? <laughs> not at all, I say, forgetting that I'm in for trouble now. And she rushes on to her next question. You can't have sex no more now, can you? <laughs> I stand up and say to all the startled kids in the room, Natalie and Willa, the other tutors, have to stop tutoring while I carry on. Did you hear what Ruby just said? But she says you can't have sex when you're old. Well, how many of you read Ann Landers this morning? They all read Ann Landers, even the ones labeled grade level 3.2, though Ann is supposedly grade level 6.7. Well, she had a column about this very thing today. 
how we stereotype the old, figure they're not like the rest of us. That's called ageism, I said, my voice rising. And it's just as bad as racism and sexism. Anne says old people can have sex as long as they want to, or as she puts it, as long as you use it, you won't lose it. <laughs> then they all laughed, even Ruby. And it was the last time she ever got personal with me. A room that was so tiny at the old central, now torn down in Minneapolis, so tiny that it was room 407 and a half. And there was only half a room. Last summer, I was at one of lo uh, several local poets asked to do a reading at the International Emily Dickinson Conference at Concordia University in St. Paul. How many of you knew about that? Oh, some of you did. Good. So I wrote two poems. I'm going to just read one of them, but I wrote two poems in honor of Emily. I don't know whether she would have approved of them or not, but one is from her poem, Wild Nights. How many of you know her poem, Wild Nights? I knew you would, but I'll read it anyhow. <laughs> wild nights, wild nights, were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart, rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might have but more tonight in thee. Wild nights. This is what we used to call in the 70s a prose poem. I know there are some people still writing them, Lou Jenkins for one, but I've started writing them again now too because I don't know what else to call these chunks of prose that I write. I don't seem to want to turn into poems. Wild nights. Here I am by the shore of Lake Wabagasset, writing in my journal, and as I gaze out, gaze out of the water, I'm suddenly transported back to Green Lake Bible Camp near Spicer, Minnesota, summer of 1943, and I can feel myself in that dank dorm cabin filled with bunk beds and I can hear Miss Greta Swinson, our counselor and student at Lutheran Bible Institute, leading us in prayer, while Gladys Swan, my best friend that year, she of the long, black, naturally curly hair, she of the long, slender neck, yes, it was swan-like. Gladys and I poked each other during the prayer because Miss Swinson was using the very phrase we two cynics had made fun of many times. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, may these precious young girls find the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and later we joked in our bunk beds about how we hadn't known Jesus was lost. And then we launched into how cute Reverend Ivar Ingebrigtsen was and how we were surely going to respond to his altar call next evening right after Singspiration, even though we steadfastly refused on all the previous nights to come forward. But now we were going to say the Holy Spirit had moved us and we were going to walk right up to kneel at the altar there by announcing to the whole camp that we had found Jesus. Because then Reverend Ingerbrigtsen, who was only in his 20s and newly graduated from Augsburg Seminary, would touch our hair as we knelt and pronounce a save by the precious blood of Jesus as the piano softly played and all the other campers, most of whom had already responded at the altar call on previous nights, quietly sang, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And Gladys and I drifted off to sleep, dreaming of the touch of Reverend Ingerbrigtsen's hand upon our hair. But our conversion didn't last long. Because when we got back to the cities, Gladys Swan's old boyfriend from Malacca, where the Swans used to live, showed up. And Gladys reported to me after Lucia League that he had kissed her and she had felt his thing jutting out and pressing right into her dotted Swiss dress. And that very night, Clarence Olson asked if he could drive me home from Lucy League. And amazingly, my dad said yes. And as we sat in Clarence's car parked right in front of our house, he leaned across the steering wheel and kissed me. But since we were sitting down, I couldn't feel his thing. But I did feel, as I told Gladys the very next day in school, his tongue pushing hot and hard against the roof of my mouth. <laughs> grandchildren, eight of them, two born the same week in April this year. Eight of them, two born the same week in April. So I wrote a poem. I've written many poems about them, but this is about my two grandsons. Fall Below Zero is coming, folks. Startled into wakefulness at 5 a.m. by my radio's weather announcement, 13 below zero with gusty winds bringing wind chill to 23 below. A sudden image of my two grandsons, Alex and Jacob, wearing, waiting for their buses, which are usually late because their driver doesn't know his way around the city. 
not wearing caps and their mittens because they're guys and they don't need to dress warmly as their grandmother would like them to, <laughs> waited until 5.20 because my daughter would be up by then getting ready to teach her 6 a.m. aerobics class. But when she answers the phone, I hear panic. What's the matter, Mom? And I realize she thinks I have bad news. So I quickly reassure her, oh, nothing. I just heard on the radio it's bitter cold today, 23 below wind chill. And I thought maybe I'd come over and take the boys to the bus stop, maybe even to McDonald's first for breakfast. Did I wake you up? I tell her to go back to sleep and call me later, which she does. And she says, Alex and Jacob are excited that I'm coming over. When they get to their house, they're not ready, so I have to sit around in my coat and hat and mittens and scarf. So finally, off we go to McDonald's, where everybody orders sausage egg biscuits with hash browns and oranges, juice. Except me, because my delicate elderly digestive system has rebelled against fast food. A great sadness to me, because I love egg McMuffins, and the prices are so affordable, even a pensioner grandmother can spoil her grandsons on a below zero morning. So we sit in my warm car in the parking lot of the grocery store, waiting for the bus, and suddenly... Jacob remembers he's supposed to bring treats for his music class buddies. And while he's inside the store, Alex's bus comes and Jacob misses his, so I have to drive him to school. <laughs> Next morning, it's 29 above zero with no wind chill. And Alex calls to say they both missed their bus. And can I take them to school? <laughs> so I throw on clothes and race over to their house, hustle them into my car. On the way, they call out plaintively from the back seat. We didn't have any breakfast. Can we stop at McDonald's? <laughs> this is called fishing. Honey, fishing. My father, born in Norway, loved to fish, but I have believed for many years I hated it. I have always sworn I would never go. Because what I remember is how I was often left on shore to take care of the three younger kids. Remember the infinite boredom of those endless hours we sat on the sand, straining our eyes to see the tiny boat far out in the lake where Dad had dropped his line. Oh, how we hoped to see him pick up his oars and start rowing back to us. So I'm amazed when I come upon my 1945 diary, the year I turned 17, how often I went fishing, even begged to go. Dad took me fishing today. Just the two of us, I caught six sunfish, I wrote. But Dad caught nothing. Try as I will, I can't remember that day. So I decide to imagine myself back in the old wooden rowboat on Lake Owasso, sitting alone with my dad. What did we talk about? Did he try to convince me I shouldn't enlist in the Army Nurse Corps? A strange vocational choice for me since I'd gotten my first C's ever in both chemistry and physics. But I was a patriotic girl, wanted to do my part in our fight for democracy. Did he try to talk me into going to Augsburg College instead? After all, he'd come straight from Norway to attend Augsburg Seminary, and he'd always assumed I'd go to our Lutheran Free Church School. I go fishing for an old memory, but no luck. It gets away without being caught. This is my millennium poem, How I Spent New Year's Eve 1999. We gathered at Bonnie and John's, friends of 40 years, grown old together. Joan and Bob and Lee and Kathy, we ate crackers and cheese and clementine oranges and drank non-alcoholic beverages three of us are in AA, Bonnie served an unusual carbonated drink made from nettles. And I tried, to, I tried to quote something I remembered about nettles and danger. I thought it was Wordsworth. Someone else said, nope, Tennyson, but Bonnie looked it up in Bartlett's and found it was from Shakespeare's Henry IV. Out of this nettle danger, we pluck the flower safety. Then we all sighed over how much of what we'd once known we had forgotten and went to the buffet table to serve ourselves Bonnie's lamb stew and Thai beef and tossed salad, followed by Bob's lemon meringue pie. Then Lee had a test for us, which we had to take individually. It took forever. He promised prizes. He gave us postage stamps from various decades enclosed in a plastic sheet. We had to guess the decade each stamp represented. We argued over the answers. Margaret Mead is clearly in a 1920s dress. I don't care if her seminal book was published in the 30s. And complained loudly that the winners didn't deserve their prizes, but we all knew we were just kidding. Later, Bonnie gave us helium-filled balloons and slips of paper, told us to write what we wanted to let go of in 2000, and tie them on the balloons. I wrote, I let go of worry. Signed my full name, Phoebe Damaris Dale. 
And we went out on the deck to watch the fireworks in the Nicollet Island, ooed and awed, and at midnight released our balloons, which flew swiftly off into the stars. Oh, I forgot to mention that Joan had brought party hats for us to wear and whistles to blow, which we all did happily and vigorously. John went to bed early on Christmas Eve. He had a mild stroke, lost speech and feeling in one side for a couple of hours. While he was in the hospital, the doctor discovered a clogged artery, deeply embedded in the base of his brain, inoperable. He'll be on blood thinners for the rest of his life. We talked about Ken and Shirley, who weren't there. Ken with prostate cancer and Shirley, a double mastectomy survivor, both down with the flu. But Bob was there, still going strong eight years after his lung cancer surgery, and Joan with her undiagnosed digestive problems, and I with my faithful companion, Wegener's granulomatosis. We're all hanging in there, ready to greet the year 2000, curious as always to find out what happens next. First morning of the new millennium, I wake into radio news. 3,000 people in South Minneapolis suffered power outages. A stray Mylar balloon had shorted out a tower. <laughs> but Bonnie called to tell me not to worry. Our balloons weren't Mylar. Me? Worry? I said. I let worrying go forever, remember? <laughs> Poem called Praise and Thanks for My Lazy Boy. I love my lazy boy. You'll find out why. Your mom wanted it out of the condo right after the funeral. So you called me. Do you want my dad's lazy boy? And I said, boy, do I ever. I've always wanted one. When can I pick it up? The sooner the better, you said. Mom's always hated that chair, because she, but she couldn't get rid of it while dad was still alive because it was his favorite, the one he sat in to watch television. So I called my son, reminded him once again how much he owes me for carrying him in my womb for nine whole months, the nausea and backache and shortness of breath and heartburn and two tight Pendleton jackets, which I had to wear in 1955 because I was teaching high school English, and as soon as you found out you were pregnant, you had to resign, and how I labored mightily for 16 hours to bring him forth. And could he perhaps at the very least find it in his heart to go over to my friend's mom's condo and carry my newly acquired lazy boy up the steps to my second floor apartment? Sure, Mom, he said. <laughs> a few hours later, he came up the sidewalk to my front door bearing the lazy boy, which turned out to be surprisingly light, on his head and shoulders. And ever since, I've lived heavily, heavily ever after, heavily too, beginning each morning with a candle lit to the memory of your dad, then reclining the chair as far back as it will go, which means I am now in a prone, or do I mean supine, position and can do my Pilates exercises before I return myself to upright with a smart switch of the faithful lever whereupon my back is ramrod straight and my legs are elevated to the proper position for alleviation of leg pain and now I take out the forest green leather journal you also gave me, pull out the gold pen tucked into a holder attached to the journal which has gold edged pages to write this poem of thanks to you for my beloved lazy boy <laughs> Three page long piece about my 50th college reunion, but I'm not going to read it. Instead, I'm going to read uh, a poem that I read at the dedication of the Mildred Pierce a year ago. Was it a year ago? Carol, was it a year ago when they dedicated the Mildred Pierce? About that. Um, a year ago in July. Right. So I wrote this poem. We had a reading here, a celebratory reading. And I wrote this poem in honor of the occasion. It's called Naming the Restaurant, Sacred Heart, Minnesota, 1935. There was a contest to name the new cafe on Main Street. So my girlfriend Patty and I decided to stop playing beauty parlor, where we took turns slurping wave set, a sort of gelatinous glop onto each other's hair, then combing it into thick movie star waves held in place by sturdy black bobby pins. Instead, we got into the restaurant naming business one humid summer day, while the rest of America was sunk in the Great Depression, hardly anyone daring to dream of opening a new business. I was a designated recorder because I'd won a pencil in a Sunday school Bible verse memorization contest. John 3.16 was inscribed on one side and on the other a thought-provoking question. God loves you. Do you love him? I scribbled names as fast as we thought of them. Grapevines entwined around our pergola house and they gently rustled in the slight breeze as we excitedly called out each new name. How about the plate and the spoon? No, I got it. The gravy boat. We knew all about the gravy poured over mounds of mashed potatoes and roast beef stacked atop a slice of Wonder Bit. The beef commercial, it was called, and local businessmen sat at the counter, hunched over it, silent and serious. We marveled at these men, the banker and the John Deere dealer and the owner of Paulson's Mercantile, 
They didn't go home and eat when the new whistle blew as we did. They stayed downtown and ate beef commercials. Finally, one of us came up with the most brilliant of all names, the Chat and Chew Cafe. We shouted out the name in glee. It sounded so right, we were sure we'd win and begin at once to plan how we'd spend the prize money. But Marcella Knutson, who had the simple but brilliant idea to name it after the owner, got the $5 instead. Now everyone called it Corrine's Corner Cafe, except Patty and me, who always called it the Chat and Tea. <laughs> Cafe poem. This is dedicated to my son, Eric, and to the New Riverside Cafe, 1970-1997. Here I am at the New Riverside Cafe on a summer Sunday morning. I have skipped church to sit here and eat heavy whole grain pancakes stuffed with pecans and bananas soaked in genuine maple syrup, probably tapped from maple trees on a cooperative tree farm. Worker owned and worker managed. Decisions arrived at only by consensus. According to my son, who will work here for 10 years after graduating from the U of M with two degrees, one in speech communications and one in studio arts. And now I am here, growing more torpid with each bite of syrup, gazing at the customers, not one of whom is wearing a suit or dress or high heels or wingtip shoes, not one of whom is aiming to break through the glass or any other kind of ceiling. In the syrup haze, my heart is filled with love from my son and all the young who dream of a new world of peace and social justice who have left the majority culture behind. When my last mortal has disappeared, I gather up my journal and my book of poems, saunter out to cross Riverside, wait at the red light next to a young mother in tie-dyed t-shirt and flowing India print gauzy skirt, with her flaxen haired toddler dressed to match her mother, and once again the thoughts of a brave new world suffuse warmth through my body until the toddler drops the box of frail as she is carrying, and all the colors magenta, sea green, goldenrod, robin's egg, blue, scatter onto the street just as the light changes to green. And then as I bend to help, I hear the mother speak the words which shatter all my hopes for the fu future. Get your shit together, rainbow! <laughs> We're going to bring you a little public service announcement now. Is anyone else hot? Yes. yes. Can we do something about the heat, Sheila? Open the door. Open the door. Well, I think they can turn the air conditioning on. Um, these readings don't happen by magic. It actually happens through the contributions of many people. And so what I'd like to do is pass the bread basket around, shall we say. Um, and what we, SASE is funded through the Metropolitan Arts Regional Council, and what, they, what it is is a matching grant. So every contribution that we get from people here, they match. So I'd like it. And the readers are paid. And the readers are paid. Yeah. <laughs> really good benefit. Praise the Lord, I can eat. Yeah. <laughs> My anorexia beat them again. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do since I can't make it through here is I'm going to start and just pass it around. If you would like to make a contribution, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Without further ado, let us bring you Bill Holm and his new book. His gorgeous new book is for sale here. So if you're interested in it, you can just make out a check to Milkweed. Twenty-two ninety-five or twenty-three bucks. Oh, to me. Oh, to you. <laughs> Erase that, to Bill. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. And now for Mr. Bill Holm, Big Bill Holm. Got to correct that because there's somebody here who remembers Big Bill. Mr. Betty gets from Minnesota knows that I am and will be till my dying day, Little Billy. <laughs> Big Bill was a real guy. That's true. I have not assumed that proportion yet. Oh, it's, I hope you're all getting along. 
It's sort of, you feel a little bit like herrings who have just been piled in a barrel and salted down for curing. I'm so glad that you're still looking a little cheerful and they're showing evidence of getting along with each other. If this were an unruly crowd, God knows where it would lead. It's so wonderful to see so many faces, so many people I haven't seen, and so many parts of my uh, checkered history come back, Lakewood, Bart, and Sister Betty, and her friend Sister Victoria, and Gary, and Esty, and Tom, and Phoebe, and Candy. Uh, this is uh, its a kind of a nostalgic moment. Phoebe, I did not meet Phoebe on Poetry Out Loud. I met Phoebe one night in St. Peter, Minnesota. My friend John Rizmerski, I was in, uh, I had a job in Virginia, and John had sent me 25 Minnesota poets. And I read Phoebe's poems and I said, Jesus, there is one genius in this book, Phoebe Hansen. He said, she's even better in person. I said, impossible. <laughs> so one night down in St. Peter, Phoebe was giving a reading at a little bookstore, now defunct. And I came in and sat in the back, and I think, I demanded the frog prints at the top of my lungs. You also stood up and recited from memory, Sacred Heart of Minnesota. Did I recite Phoebe Hassan from memory? In Sacred Heart of Minnesota. In Sacred Heart of Minnesota, we Lutherans no, barely knew the Catholic kids. Their mothers smoked camels, played bridge instead of played easy. Their fathers, lying under their shivvies, cursed God damn, bringing the motors back to life. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> we pressed, uh, we built bird baths made of cement, pressing splinters of wet glass into their wet breasts. Hosiery salesmen driving through to the cities marveled. Hobos who asked at our back doors for food were given glasses of buttermilk because it was good for them. <laughs> when I was eight, a big Catholic kid asked me up to his garage loft to see his crucifix. <laughs> but even then I knew that Lutherans are justified by faith alone and kept my legs crossed. <laughs> I've loved Phoebe's work now for 27 years, and I've been one of the people who have been Baiting her to get that book in print, not for her sake. I don't give a damn if she amounts to anything or not. She was raised in the Norwegian Free Church. But she also understands stewardship. And when you're given a gift in a talent the size of Phoebe's, you need to give it to your neighbors. It's your Lutheran duty. <laughs> and I thought that always that in a culture in which there's so much emptiness... I was going to begin by, you know, amusing you tonight by giving you moments of high wit and elegance from the Bush-Gore debates. <laughs> Isn't that disgusting that the richest country in the world with more colleges than any other country, a higher NASDAQ and Dow Jones, and more than enough guns to blow up the entirety of humanity, has those two bozos running for president? <laughs> Sounds like two eighth graders in remedial math arguing about long division. If there were one sentence of idealism, one sentence of real feeling, one sentence indicating that either of those bozos had an interior life or any sense of what a country ought to be, it would be quite extraordinary, but we're not going to get it. So I won't share high moments of wit and eloquence from the Bush Gore debates with you. Yeah. That depress you all sufficiently? <laughs> well, literature's a great thing. Phoebe and I met 26, 7 years ago. I was 9 and Phoebe was 12. <laughs> but we're still at it, because that's what you do. And you don't do it to get rich and famous. You do do it literally out of a sense of vocation. I think Sister Betty understands that. You do it because you can do it and you think you ought to. And you think that somebody in a civilization probably needs or wants this done. And besides, you were never doomed to be a diesel mechanic. So it is. And besides, when you're a writer, the quality of your mail increases <laughs> astonishingly. And I'd like to read you a personal letter which I received last week. 
I may meet this fellow, and I like the poem, and I was touched by this letter, oddly. Never met the fellow. Dear Bill, we have the same last name. <laughs> the following is a poem I began on March 1977. You can have it published if you want. <laughs> I believe it to be a great poem about Christ. I have sent it to Billy Graham, too. <laughs> I like being included in that too. <laughs> if you like it, please send me a letter. Thanks again. And then a fellow named Holm. And actually, the poem is quite wonderful. It's a hobo poem, a poem about meeting Christ in a hobo jungle. And evidently, the hobo's nickname for Christ was Jerusalem Slim. <laughs> and it's a pretty good poem. I may sign it, send it to the New Yorker, get a check, and write to this fellow and say, thanks for offering me the loan of your poem. I did pretty well with it. <laughs> but what it also means is that there's someone out there who wants literature, there's someone out there who reads literature, and that there are ordinary people who try to make literature to the best degree that they can. And that means that despite Bush and Gore, we are not lost as a culture or as a civilization. If we can just keep from blowing ourselves and everybody else up, who knows, we might amount to something when we grow up as a country. Uh, I'm going to read you a couple of poems and a little interruption at the beginning of Phoebe's reading I do not apologize for. Marcy went to the airport to pick up two of my oldest and dearest friends in the world who are precious to me. Uh, Wincy Johannstotter, who has been my friend for many, many years and my teacher and my mentor, and to whom the book is dedicated, the Eccentric Islands book. And Valgev Thorvaldson, who late one night intemperately offered to sell me a little house next to the sea. So I now have a little house in Hofsos. I've become a Skagafield man. Valgev is a remarkable fellow, and he's a character in the book, too. I think most of what I said about the two of them is true. Part. <laughs> they know me well. <laughs> when they came here, they just arrived from Reykjavik and got off the plane about an hour ago and got through customs. So it's about four in the morning in Reykjavik. If they go face forward on the table, forgive them. <laughs> so I'm going to read a little poem for Wincy that I wrote this summer. This is a kind of woman's poem, and I suppose men aren't really in on this sort of thing. Phoebe might get a kick out of this. It's a sort of Phoebe Hansen poem from my point of view. It's, it has come to think of it. It's called Icelandic Recycling on a Summer Night for Wincy. I should tell you that where I, my little house that I bought looks out over a 4,000-foot ridge of mountains and an 8-mile-wide fjord, and it turns pink in the middle of the night. It never gets dark. The light is extraordinary. Uh, and every night this would happen, and uh, you know, and I would my jaw would just drop, and I'd sit there, even for me, speechless, you know, feeling like Wordsworth, stunned at the sublimity of nature. And one night this happened. I had four. There were four ladies in the house, and me. And when this happened, this is the poem: Icelandic recycling on a summer night. <clears throat> Toward midnight, the sky pinks up. The low cloud at the bottom of Tindestol turns the color of wild grapes. Inside, four women sit around a table, oblivious to natural phenomena, practicing to fold plastic bags into neat white triangles. <laughs> Ever so much nicer to store, says Wednesday. <laughs> they are performing women's work, tidying up the garbage till it looks like modern sculpture. <laughs> They've seen it all before. Midnight sun, revolution, disease, chaos. Their female wisdom comprehends that there is nothing to be done about chaos except bring order and harmony to plastic bags, as if they were wandering children needing to be tucked in neatly for the long night. <laughs> yeah. are, as Howard Moore would say, a heck of a deal. If you want some instructions afterwards, just bring a bag up here to the front table. Marcy knows how to do it, too. I'm going to read one new gambling poem just for those of you who are passing up a night at the casino to be here in the herring barrel listening to poetry. One, 
of the astonishing things of my early middle age is I never would have believed it that I'd be standing outside in blizzards outside my own office smoking a cigarette at the age of 57, but that within 50 miles of my house, I could lose a farm, three houses, and every penny I ever made in a casino, legally with the encouragement of the state. It's kind of remarkable when you think about it. it? <laughs> Makes me think we probably all ought to smoke more cigarettes. <laughs> Hallelujah at the Sioux Falls Airport. At the bar at the Joe Foss Field in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, a few idlers sipping whiskey wait for late airplanes to arrive. Not a soul says a word. But out of the silence comes nasal music, a familiar tune. Hallelujah, hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, sings the video poker machine. <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody filled an inside straight. All those cause for praise and rejoicing. <laughs> For applause, quarters clatter down the metal birth canals. <laughs> Silence again at Joe Foss Field. Not a soul looks up from his whiskey or sings aloud amen or toasts the omnipotence of luck. <laughs> I started this book both because I love to travel and I love islands. And my joke is that, you know, if you're in Minneota and you want to see what's over the next hill, it's about 1,500 miles. And by that point, you may as well see what the ocean looks like. And it's remarkably short of tidal action on the Dakota border. I think there was something in me, ancestrally, at DNA. I wouldn't have been a poet if I lived close to the sea, I think. When I got mad at my father, or something, you know, I was discontented as a teenager, I'd have gone down to the harbor and shipped out. And I'd have been some grizzled old seaman who could stand it to be on land for about two days before he went back on board. So I always loved the sea, and of course that's where islands are, out in the middle of the sea. So this book is my homage to that habit of mine. And it also uses the curious fact that when my grandfather, who had a farm next to the sea, moved from Iceland to Minneota in 1885, he had to take citizenship name. The Icelanders, like the Norwegians and the Chinese and the Russians and the Swedes, didn't have last names, same last name in the family. If you were, if I, if the wife kept her maiden name, and then the children were someone's daughter. Wincy, for instance, is Johan Stockton, the daughter of Johan Anderson, and her son is uh, Peterson, the son of Peter. So you go up to a door and here are five or six last names. So well, that's un-American. It's probably communist, though they didn't have a ball party. And when he went down to Marshall, nobody could pronounce names like Gatskogson and the Hotkins dot it anyway. So the guy at the immigration booth said, give us something we can spell. One name allowed. So my grandfather took the name Holm, which is the equivalent of John Doe. It's a kind of common Norse name for Danes and Swedes and Norwegians and occasionally Icelanders. But interestingly enough, it means little island. Isn't that funny? Uh, so I thought, what a, what a great piece of humor to settle as far from salt water as you can get anywhere on this planet except central Siberia and then to call yourself island. <laughs> Required a certain rakish humor, I think. <laughs> And when I was a little kid, I made up an island in the middle of one of my father's fields where he didn't plow around a cottonwood tree. I'll read you a couple of paragraphs out of a few chapters that I'm fond of. One of the chapters is about the leper priest, Father Damien, who uh, was the only man brave enough to go and live with the lepers at Molokai in the 19th century. I wrote this essay at Blue Cloud Abbey, a Benedictine abbey uh, in South Dakota, and I went out and I read it to the old priest who gave me the story, Father Augustine. And if you think it's terrifying to look at a herring barrel full of your faces, I had to face this 80-year-old priest and say, now, did I quote you right? Did I remember that story correctly? And he was very sweet. He said, amazing, you got it. And I think you'd had a drink, too. <laughs> so I consider that I now have the Neil Obstet and the imprimatur for that story at the end. 
But I wanted to read you the first two pages, which are about a small town phenomena that Phoebe will remember. And that's, in small towns, if anything happened, you didn't talk about it. And if there were family secrets, you didn't mention them. In my small town, secrets disappeared. Retarded children vanished into the upstairs bedrooms of farmhouses, where someone carried food to them. They did not emerge in the presence of company, even neighbors having morning coffee. I remember hearing, probably by mistake, four children mentioned on a neighboring farm. Who besides Bert and Elmer and Mabel, I asked. Never mind, their brother stays upstairs. It's not your business. Pregnant unmarried girls were not mentioned once they had been safely transported to the anonymity of Minneapolis to give birth. Most never came back, though sometimes the babies appeared in other houses. Virgin births dropped by a prairie stork. When depression, that's true, isn't it? When depression or any form of madness visited a house, someone disappeared, often a woman who was described as resting because of nerves. I spent my boyhood blissfully unaware of how many neighbors had experienced shock treatments. Some diseases prompted rich stories. Details of diarrhea, flatulence, pustular spellings, and multiple stitches were much loved. (laughs) But I never heard the word tuberculosis, though I even had an aunt dying of it. Suicide? Silence. The gay uncle? more silence. Prison? Nobody we knew. (laughs) Maybe there was a mysterious island somewhere in Lake Superior where they all went. The sacred idiots, the swollen bellies, the straitjackets, the hemorrhaging lungs, the limp-wristed, the jailbirds, all having tea together (laughs) far away from us. (laughs) The other sure path to disappearance, if you were Lutheran, was to marry a Catholic and turn with a capital I capitalized the previous verb deliberately because of its weight to turn meant exile from your family your former life often having turned you were instructed never to darken the door of your father's house and often for the rest of your life you didn't Presumably the same shunning worked its magic in Catholic families, too. (laughs) Sell your children's souls to the priest? Out. Insult the Holy Father and the true church? Out. In Minneota, this religious war assumed at least one comic aspect because of the town's ethnic peculiarities. Half Scandinavian, mostly Icelandic and Norwegian, and half Flemish-speaking Belgians. The Belgians were the dark repositories of unreformed apostasy. (laughs) The Belgians presumably got similar warnings about godless Icelanders. This succeeded, in my case at any rate, in making Belgians the most supremely attractive people on earth. (laughs) I still fall in love with that black hair, those pale hands, fingering rosaries. I was nevertheless fascinated by by the pious literature in my Belgian neighbors' houses. Missile saints' lives, heroic tales of martyred missionaries, all heavy with the stamps of the censor Liborum. It must have been while snooping in some such book or pamphlet that I discovered the story of Father Damien of Molokai. I assumed at the time that Damien showed up so often because of Belgian ethnic pride. He was a native son of Flemish-speaking peasants. But I've since come to understand that the power of his biography moves almost anyone who takes the trouble to know it. Even saints be praised, Protestants and free thinkers. <laughs> and then I've got a long and rather grim essay on the history of leprosy and the history of Damien. And Damien, of course, dies of leprosy. I'll read you just the tail end of this. Uh, when I was I was finishing this essay at Blue Cloud Abbey, and Father Augustine, who was 80 years old and who was born in Hawaii, came up to knocked on the door at 10 o'clock at night. You know, you're know, supposed to be in bed early in an abbey. But the old monks had given me a room to write in where I could smoke away and write and stay up all night. And he knocked the door. He said, "Are you? am I disturbing you? And I said, not at all. I said, I've gotten stupid and happy for the company. So he came in and told me a wonderful story. That when they moved Damien's body 47 years after he died of leprosy in 1936, the church had a devil's advocate. I don't think they do it anymore, but they used to then. When someone was proposed for sainthood, uh, they would get an ecclesiastical lawyer who was called the devil's advocate, and his job was to doubt everything. 
to be a complete skeptic. What do you mean a miracle? That's just crap. That doesn't happen. Prove it to me. You you haven't got any evidence for that. Where the hell are your witnesses? Ah, that's no good. I won't accept that. So this is a good job for politicians, huh? (laughs) The devil's advocate. But when he was along when they moved Damien's body, and they found that after 47 years, rain had eaten a hole in the cover of the coffin, but they looked inside it, and they thought they'd just find, you know, mush or dried bones. There was Damien's beard and his face, and you could recognize him. They thought, weird. So the body was heavier than they expected, and they were moving it out of this sarcophagus underground, and it tipped when it was going up the steps. And the devil's advocate saw the head go like this inside the coffin. And I thought it was just Damien saying, Nah, leave me here. I don't want to go back to Belgium. It's cold there. Leave me in Hawaii. But it, uh, it's an amazing story. And I listened to it, and I thought afterwards, I'm an old apostate Lutheran. Here's a classic Catholic miracle story, and I believed every word of it. And it was told to me under magical circumstances, so I used the story. And finally, it doesn't make any difference if that story is true. Carol Bly and I, I think, disagree on this. Because in essence, that story tells us something about what Damien did for his fellow human beings and about the regard that we ought to have for him. And besides, the devil's advocate was probably a reliable guy. At any rate, we go to the overlook 2,000 feet over the sea and... uh, looked down at the old leper colony and Marcy and I are there with a couple of other old friends and I tell this story and then finally we go back after we've been touring for the afternoon to the hotel where we stayed on Molokai great island there's only one golf course and it's losing money (laughs) after the overlook the four old friends went back to the Pauhana Hotel they had a fish in the hotel cafe passing up the spam dinner Hawaiians eat 50 pounds of Spam per Hawaiian per year. (laughs) They love them in Austin. (laughs) Then adjourn to the bar for the dance. When the hotel hotel itself is as unpretentious as a Super 8 in Grigla, Minnesota, the bar is remarkable. A massive banyan tree grows in the middle of it, providing the only roof. I wrote a little prose poem that night describing this sweet, lively dance. Dancing in February. Molokai. The band in the Pauhana Hotel on Molokai tunes up on Friday night. The dance floor is open to the sea, full moon above, the shadow of Lanai across the channel, not a single light on the mountain. A massive old banyan tree grows in the middle of the bar, spreading out its enormous horizontal branches over the whole hotel as if patting us on the head, saying, it's all right. The band leads off with country music, Hawaiian style. Ukulele plinking, guitar twanging, and sliding. Funny face, I love you. A dapper, white-haired old Hawaiian changes partners on every song. Fat, thin, old, young, howly, local, he loves them all. A woman is a woman when you're shaking it. The band works up to old rock and roll and then lets fly. The whole place erupts with dancing, even the sprinkle of pale tourists. What a grand mixture of funny faces. Some beautiful, some not. Um, Some some maybe, some some beautiful, some maybe, some maybe not. They are half this, half that, half some other thing. More halves than add up in the statistic world, but here tonight, they add up nicely. It's a happy crew shaking their hind ends. Nobody wants to punch anybody else or argue or brood tonight, anyway. And why not be glad? For the banyan tree and the moon and the shadowy mountains on Lanai and the noisy sea and the ukulele and the cold beer and the beautiful girl and the loud drum. It occurs to me now that that banyan tree, its gnarled branches like a huge malformed leprous hand spread over that bar to offer the blessing of nature. After a while, the four old friends left, like old Walt Whitman in his poem about the learned astronomer rising and gliding out into the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looking up in perfect silence at the stars. We drove back up to the middle of the island, past the golf course, past the Holsteins, past the Pauhana parking lot. The moon was full, the night sky a blend of pale gray and ice blue. No one brought a flashlight, so we stumbled a little awkwardly into the ironwoods and eucalyptus until some night vision took over. 
We followed the breathing noise, somehow louder in the moonlight. When we came out of the woods, there it was, the dark tongue laying in the water, lying in the water, the surf now silvery and glowing by moonlight. A few thousand feet below, the scattered lights from the houses of the old lepers flickered like fireflies in the half-dark. We stood for a long time in silence in that strange light, listening to the sea, looking north. The church may be waiting for a little while to canonize Damien, but I assumed my private authority in the church of Walt Whitman and sanctified that place as Saint Kalopapa. I pray for it to intercede for me whenever fear takes over inside me. By this intense moonlight I call the island of the doomed, instead the island of the blessed, the island of the human, the island of the big mystery that Walt Whitman found growing in the grass on whatever island where you live. Then I'll read you a couple of paragraphs out of the Iceland essay. Can I take my coat off? But I have to get my microphone out of here. Yeah, are the herring sweating? Are you getting salted nicely? Does anybody begin to dislike the person sitting next to you? Anybody feeling any rising hostility here? Just want to know, you know, it's, sometimes I used to be a barroom piano player, and I'd be playing some, you know, quiet, delicate piece, and a fight would erupt behind the piano bench. And I'd look over my shoulder, and here would be two people trying to throw each other over tables and throwing beer gal glasses at each other. You don't want that to happen in regions. I think the kitchen should turn the air conditioning on. That's been the suggestion here from the front of the room. Isn't it wonderful to need air conditioning in Minnesota on October 15th? Just remember, gang, February is coming. Store it up. Sweat with pleasure. Let's see, like this paragraph. It's uh, I stayed on a farm in Iceland in 1979, and it was like being in the Middle Ages. Iceland has gone high tech in the last 20 years, but in 1979, you still had the old farmhouses with the barns right next to the house, so that all was inside the house. There was a little smell of manure, but in the winter time, you could go right down to the horse barn or the sheep barn, and the heat from the animals helped to heat the houses. So there was an old fashioned farm. It was also an old-fashioned farm in that it had little of this and little of that, you know, before Earl Butts and the Get Bigger, Get Out farm movement. So it was mostly a sheep farm. They had horses and a cow or two and some chickens, and even a hired man from the United States who was a complete idiot. That was me. And every morning, it was the job of the 13-year-old sister to milk the cow. That was the division of labor. Because you wouldn't want women. Women didn't work with sheep. Sheep were for men. <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't let the little lady out there with the sheep because the sheep were dangerous. It was a guy's work. <laughs> now, the women, they could handle the horses, you know, and the cattle, but not sheep. It just wasn't a thing for the little woman to fool around with. <clears throat> Which gives you some idea of how these things change from culture to culture. <laughs> Icelanders are not early risers, particularly not 13-year-old Icelanders. As in every peasant culture on the planet, it is the job of young girls to milk cows. It was Kidda's job. At 13, she was a dreamy girl, still stepping delicately onto the cliff edge of whether to become a woman or not. For the summer, she put off deciding, instead electing to become better acquainted with her dreams. This required not rising early. <laughs> the old brown family cow, whose name was probably Bukadla, sauntered up to the fence next to the house, hung her melancholy head into the yard, and gave expression to her swollen tits with long, imploring moans. She was usually attended by a menagerie consisting of the sheepdog, the cats waiting for spilt milk, a few chickens, a mentally challenged rumped brown sheep that had been exiled from the flock. <laughs> Holm remembered watching this wonderful tableau every morning, then hearing the voice of Gunna, the housewife, Fardu al fighter, Kidda, get to your feet, get out of bed. Then after a painful interval, Kidda appeared, pulling a sweater over her still drowsy head, grabbing the three-legged stool and pail, 
to relieve old Bukadla's misery where she stood. The cats snapped to attention at the ping of the squirting milk into the bottom of the tin pail. The squeehawky sheep rolled his crossed eyes as if he had no idea what was going on, <laughs> but might be enjoying it. Lord, 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 thought home as he took a mental photograph of this scene. In what century do I live? Do I like this one or the other one? Is this some great old novel I have wandered into? Or maybe an old Icelandic poem with the full panoply of rhyme and alliteration about a young girl milking a brown cow on a summer morning a few miles south of the Arctic Circle. And every book American books and resume his other life. Now he had 250, maybe 500 words of Icelandic, all glotted together without the grammar that enabled them to make sense. <laughs> but it was, to quote Howard Moore, a hell of an experience. <laughs> Howard's a character early in this essay. On one of his last weekends in the country, everybody stopped work early to go to a Seitabal, a country dance in Reidafjörður, the fjord just south of Eilsad. They all piled into the farm, the farm's name was Gilsautegr, into the Gilsautegr Land Rover, Jon and Gunna, Bjussi and Sala, Thorhadla and Vilhjalmer, that's me, for the trip <laughs> south. They were armed with seven up bottles of Landi, the Icelandic white lightning, and home may have added a flask of scotch smuggled up from Reykjavik. Thorhadla volunteered to be the designated sober driver, a necessity in Iceland even in those days while the rest of us enjoyed the fruits of farm chemistry to loosen up the soul a little. Icelandic country dances are remarkable. They begin late, about midnight sometimes, and go till the last dancer drops, often at an hour when Puritans rise from bed. <laughs> the invariably skilled bands play every conceivable sort of music, Old-time waltzes, polkas, foxtrots, sambas, bossa novas, cha-chas, tangos, rock and roll, country western, square dances, funky chickens, <coughs> and probably if you ask them, pavins, galliards, minuets, and gavats. Everyone dances with everyone. Children with grandpas, mothers with sons, old with young. Choose your sex, but choose somebody. They dance hard and they dance steady. They are not shy about moving their feet. And often old farmers are astonishingly graceful ballroom dancers. That's as true here as it is there. You used to see the best polkaing in Minneapolis over at Maeslack's Bar on the north side. And the polka uh, dancers would be about 300 pounds at about 75 or 80 years old. But Lord, did they move it. Is that still there, by the way? Yeah. Can you still see that? Yep. Yeah. Good. I'm pleased to know that something in the culture survives intact. They dance hard and they dance steady. They are not shy about moving their feet, and often old farmers are astonishingly graceful ballroom dancers. When they have worked themselves into a sweat, they go to the parking lot with flasks and swing grandly on white lightning. Sometimes they get drunk and fight, but it feels more like ritual than passion or hatred. 
Sometimes they get randy and kiss everyone in sight and make outrageous propositions for dalliances. The actors at an Icelandic country dance are not small-hearted or timid, and they don't like it very much if you insist on being a purse-lipped disapprover or a constipated Puritan. A dance is a serious matter, and you had damned well better enjoy it. <laughs> and so we all did. Holm can no more dance than he can speak Icelandic or play hockey. But that night, by God, he danced. He flirted. He made a fool of himself. He kissed several women he had never met. He did not fight, but he laughed. And then he danced some more probably destroyed 30 or 40 perfectly respectable Icelandic toes. He may have been the tango king. He doesn't remember. <laughs> but he does remember his Thothadla's laughter as she loaded them all back into the Land Rover to drive an hour north from the sloshing Atlantic at the bottom of the long fjord, back home, home on the island where he first shouted out to all the interior angels, The hell with continents! Let me die here, where I could be thrown into the sea to circle the planet forever as a pink whale, spouting the foam of poetry up into the chilly air. Thank you. What a great honor to read you. both Phoebe and Bill home and to have and to have Bill singing. What more could you ask for in life? Maybe you and I should go on the road together. Yes. <laughs> there are many other fine poets in the audience tonight. I was going to try to introduce people, but it would we'd be here for days. Molly Culligan, however, does teach tango lessons, and so we may have to send her to Washington. You have been a very patient, wonderful, fabulous audience. Mildred Pierce thanks you. My name is Carol Connolly. I thank you. If you need another little touch of Bill Holm, he is reading tomorrow night at the Open Book at 7.30. 7.30 or 8 at the Open Book. Books left. If you would like to buy a book, I'm going to sign it as soon as I have a cigarette. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Give yourselves a round of applause. I think we should say thank you.